Thank you so much for being part of Penns Creek Camp this evening. Appreciate you being here. Appreciate the camp meeting messenger. And I was uh, taking a look at that of loving memory of Barry Arnold and that great picture. And uh, there was so much he accomplished in his life with the Lord's help. He, he was uh, unbelievable when he got saved, called to preach. And it's just amazing how that in his senior year of high school, senior year of high school, he preached over a hundred times. Isn't that amazing? A senior. And they had a five-week revival. And many people were saved. And many people were sanctified. And then all down through the years, God used him. But God's missionary church, especially some things that he touched on, being the pastor there at Lebanon for 35 years. Then the gospel center, connections for preaching as a young preacher guy. And then bringing that into the conference and the gospel center. And part of us now because of Brother Arnold and, and his vision for that. And then, of course, the co-founder, God's missionary youth camp. Years ago, Brother Schaefer and him got together, had a desire to help their young people to be established and strengthened in God, and those two come together for that very first one. Then all these years later, God's still using it, so thank God for that vision. And then I'm, I'm thinking of Solomon, you know, God gave him the vision along with the others for this children's thing, and of course his, his grandfather was with Brother Arnold and created that with God's help and started that, and we thank God for the vision of uh, Brother Schaefer with the children, and God is using that in a powerful way uh, in God's missionary church. I was just thanking God, wasn't you, the two children, to say that they, one of them got saved. Doesn't that bless you? And out there at uh, Colorado Springs, another uh, child got saved out there, and, and then a dad got saved. God still wanted to save people, isn't he? Yes, sir. Yes. Amen. So let's just keep laboring for him. Let's keep laboring for him. Uh, Brother Arnold, just an uh, inspiration to us. Of course, co-founder of the bus convention. And that's so impacted so many of our lives down through the years. So we just want to take a moment to say uh, thank God for Brother Arnold. And I was so privileged to be part of that service today and be able to have a few words to represent God's missionary church and ourselves. And we just appreciate what God has already done for his homecoming. Coming, we thank God for that. Again, thank you for being at camp. Good crowd tonight. Appreciate you being here. Brother Cassidy, come and lead us. Number 378 in your hymnal, number 378. I'm glad for the reality of this song tonight. Jesus didn't save me and leave me in my sin. But thank God he took them all away. Aren't you glad for that? What a wonderful message. You can be free from sin. Have victory in Jesus Christ. Number 378. Let's sing together.
you? Do you know that reality tonight? No condemnation. Wonderful, wonderful. I think Brother Dirk is the one that said the other evening, if you go to bed as a holy person, something to this effect, you can wake up as a holy person. No condemnation. Hallelujah. Being free from sin because of the power of the blood of Jesus Christ, able to take our way our sin. I'm glad for that tonight. Amen. Let's stand together. Number 408. Song number 408. tire singing about Jesus. I just don't get weary of it. Thank God for the shackles that are broken tonight. Thank God for freedom. 
I don't know what bound you, but one of the things that bound me more than anything was I was afraid. I was afraid of everything. I was afraid of people. I was afraid of my own shadow. I was afraid of obeying God in a service like this, just being free and minding God. But uh, the wonderful change that comes into our hearts when Jesus really saves us, takes away our sins, and gives us a new heart. Hallelujah. Amen. Thank God for for redemption tonight. Salvation we can know about. Bless his wonderful name. Thank you, Brother Cassidy, for leading us in those songs. Thank you for singing like you meant it tonight. I believe that many of you know what you're singing about. Amen. We're going to go to the Lord in a time of congregational prayer. We certainly want to continue to pray for those that are grieving. Remember the Sankey family. Remember the Arnold family. Many of our churches have people that have lost loved ones. We, have, we had a funeral uh, connected with our church today. Uh, no doubt there were others that, that had funerals or will have funerals. And Lebanon has another funeral on Friday. So there are people grieving across our conference and across our movement. Let's continue to pray for one another. Let's remember our nation tonight. Let's remember Israel. If you're watching what's happening in Israel with the recent attack by Hezbollah and uh, the counterattack yesterday and uh, just a tinderbox. And let's pray for Israel tonight, for the leaders of that nation Let's remember Brother DiStefano, who did have, I believe, a successfully had the stent placed and is in recovery. Let's continue to pray for Brother DiStefano tonight. And then also, many of you would know uh, Brother Bob Thornton, who is, uh, if he makes it through the night, will come home tomorrow on hospice care. And so let's pray for Brother Thornton tonight. Let's pray for his family. Let's trust God for this service. It's been a long day. Brother Durkee is scheduled to speak tonight. Let's pray for God to anoint him anew and afresh. And speak to us through him. Let's stand together. Good to have Brother Matt Ellison, pastor of the Hope Sound Bible Church, with us tonight. We welcome him to the camp, to this platform. Brother Ellison, come and lead us to the throne of grace. Let's all lift with him as we talk to God tonight. Before we pray, I just would like to give one more request, and that is Pastor Pierpoint there at Hope Sound just came home, is on hospice, and could not make it through the week, perhaps. And I know the family, the Pierpoint family, would very much appreciate our prayers as well. Let's join together in prayer, please. Dear Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for a Savior that would love a sinner such as I. Dear Lord, we stand here tonight unworthy of your love, unworthy of your mercy and your grace. Dear Lord, but we stand here humbled in your presence. Dear Lord, standing here knowing that our hearts are okay with you. Our hearts have been uh, purged by the blood of Jesus Christ. And Lord, we're so thankful for salvation. We're thankful that there is no condemnation in our heart, even at this moment, dear God. And up-to-date victory is in our life, dear God. We recognize that that is there only because of your grace, only because of your mercy and your faithfulness. Dear Lord, your love that loved us with an everlasting love. Dear Lord, uh, an unchanging love. Dear Lord, we praise you this evening for who you are and the privilege that we have on this uh, Tuesday evening to come and, and to worship you together with, with saints of God. Dear Lord, even from different walks of life, but we're here to worship you and lift up your name and praise you for your grace and praise you for your goodness. Lord, we love you tonight. We have so much to be thankful for. And may it always be said that we'll always tell the story shouting glory, glory, glory because of your grace in our life. May we never take it for granted, but Lord, we just love you this evening. But dear God, as children of God, it's wonderful to come into your presence, dear Lord, and to lay our burdens down and to lay our concerns and our petitions at your feet knowing that you are a God that never changes and knowing that you are a God that there is nothing too hard for you. And so, Lord, as we are here tonight, we take courage and we are comforted in the fact there's nothing in our mind, nothing in our hearts, nothing, dear Lord, connected to us that is too hard for you to take care of. You, the creator of all things, dear Lord, what could be hard for you? And so, Lord, we just come and ask that you would comfort the hearts that need comfort. And dear Lord, that you would uh, uh, give healing to those that need healing. You would help those that are on hospice tonight, dear Lord. We ask that you would be uh, with Brother Thornton and Brother Pierpoint, dear Lord. We ask that you would be with them and their families in a special way. Uh, Dear Lord, we ask that you would just continue to move among us here in this camp meeting. Dear Lord, in this service tonight, would you be with Brother uh, Dirk as he would share the message, Lord, and anoint him 
Help him, Lord, but as he preaches from what you've laid on his heart, give us ears to hear and, and a determination that we're going to mind you and walk in the light. Uh, dear Lord, continue to help the Cassidy's as they sing in every part of this service. Lord, may you be the focal point of it. And as you are, would you draw hearts and lives to you. And as you would help us, we'll thank you and praise you for all that you continue to do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <laughs> That's good, isn't it? Amen. It's good to be real in our hearts and our life. Just don't plan on doing anything else but serving Jesus. He satisfies, and we know he'll continue to satisfy. He's always going to bring us through, isn't he? Amen. Thank God. He's leading us. Praise be to his name. Ushers will come me this time if they would. I want to report on our World Missionary Offering last night was $1,151, so thank you for giving the World Missions in that pre-service. Thank you for, so much for that. Last night in our offering for our camp was $921, $921. Again, thank you for your giving to our camp last night, and then brings us to a total needed of $32,724 uh, as our need for a camp. And basically, we're pretty well where we were last year. We're basically where we were five years ago in my report. So we're right in the neck of the woods that we usually hang around uh, at the beginning of camp. 
And uh, of course, we'll get a report a little later on those line, online giving. Uh, the last couple of years, over and over again, they've been helping us in the camp and giving our camp, and we thank God for the online givers. And then the pledge cards on the window seal. Everyone's grabbed them throughout camp and fill them out, and we start reporting those and uh, have a year to give the pledge cards. We just thank you for supporting Penns Creek Camp. We know you're going to continue to do that, and we thank you for being part of this service tonight. Brother Nathan Schaefer, pastor of our York Church, would you pray, Brother Nathan, for this offering, please? Father in heaven, thank you for this day. Thank you for your love to us. Lord, it takes a lot of money to run your work, and the people have it. They need to give it. We're to continue, so Lord, supply the need because you're a good God, and we thank you. And everyone said, Amen. Almost wanted to sing it, didn't you? Amen. That was good, wasn't it? Thank you so much for the offering. Thank you for the playing. And we're going to continue to look to the Lord throughout this camp meeting for God to supply the needs. I already said about our camp, thank, we thank God for the young people scattered throughout and up front. Appreciate their involvement in the service and their desire to serve God. May God just continue to bless every one of them in our camp. God bless them. Thank you, man, for playing. Cassie's going to share now. God bless them as they do. And Brother Dan Durkee will share God's word. God bless them.
beautiful song and we certainly appreciate that good truth tonight through music thank you Cassidy's and um, I've often said that you may be the only Bible that somebody's reading your life and all oh, that they would see Jesus in us amen amen that's my desire what a great crowd thank you for coming out on a beautiful beautiful Tuesday evening it's been a it's been a full couple of days for many and we're just so, so thankful that you're here. I know that I speak on behalf of all the camp board members. I'm a part of that. Uh, we want to thank Brother Cassidy. He's led the services throughout this day for us. And uh, Brother Buckler and Brother Statler for preaching. And many of us were gone throughout the day. We want to say thank you. God richly, richly bless you. It's so good. And uh, I, I think they came in yesterday, but it's so good to see our friends from Tennessee. Willard and Darlene Brinkman, so glad you've come. I heard you were coming. I don't have to tell you how I knew that, but it is so good to have you at Penn's Creek Camp. Thank you, thank you. I hope you're going to stick around for a little while. We'll get to visit, but it's good to have you here. And all of you, so good to have you here. I thought as I was sitting on the platform tonight, my, oh my, I wish I, I, wish I could be like Dr. Black. He's already preached, helping out the beginning of the camp, and he's sitting back there enjoying his grandkids. I saw you, Brother Black, and I thought, man, wouldn't that be a neat thing to be doing right about now? But it's not my lot, but my, so my, my grandkids are here, and I'm so thankful. God has been good. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. If you brought a Bible, we invite you to turn there and stand with me, if you're able, in reverence of God's Word. First Thessalonians chapter 4, and we'll begin with verse number 13. I couldn't help but think of this thought as we were at the funeral and then at the, at the graveside. And, um, you know, we've had, obviously, preachers. We have those things, many graveside services. And um, the Lord began to press this on my mind as I left there and throughout the, the remaining portion of this evening prior to the service tonight. And just felt like this is where God wanted us to go for tonight. And I love this scripture, verse 13, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13. But I... Would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that you sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep, for the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout. And with the voice of the archangel, the trump of God, the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we, which are alive and remain, shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet, to meet the Lord in the air. So shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Does that bring comfort to you tonight? Does it really bring comfort to know that one of these days, one of these days, Jesus Christ 
can come back any moment. One of these days, He can come back and, and he, can, he can take us out and we can and be with Him forever. To be with those who've already been laid to rest, that have, uh, that have made uh, their, their crossing shore, that knew the reality of clean hands and a pure heart like a, a Barry Arnold or a Leonard Sankey. Oh, what a hope we have. I hope that brings you comfort tonight. I love the scripture out of Matthew chapter 25 and verse 6. I love this, this, this scripture verse. It says, Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Go ye out to meet him. Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Go ye out to meet him. I'm here to tell you that if these words don't bring a comfort to you tonight, you've come to the right place. Penns Creek Camp is the right place. God's missionary churches are the right places. The, the ministry of men like Barry Arnold who would have so it would have given you the truth and told you that Jesus loves you, that He died on the cross for your sins so that someday you could go to heaven too. What a hope tonight. I'm glad you're here. Amen. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we need your help tonight as we endeavor to preach this simple truth. Lord, we can't preach on our own. We need your help and anointing tonight. Give us unction from on high, Lord. May your will be accomplished. And we'll thank you and we'll praise you in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. You may be seated. I remember my wife and I, we were pastoring at Gratz, and um, we were in the transitional time. We had already uh, was elected and assigned to become the president of Penview, and um, a new pastor was going to be coming to Gratz, and we were working on that transitional time, and I think it was the summertime, if I'm not mistaken, I think it was. And I got a phone call early in the morning. And uh, I mean, you know, I don't know, it was early. I, I was still in bed, and I, you know, I'm not a 10 o'clock sleep-in guy. But I got a call early in the morning from, uh, from another friend of mine, and his name was Jim Plank. And he calls me early, and I'm like, what in the world? And he said, he said, Durkee, he said, he said, um, he said, what would you think about you and your wife joining Marie and I for an IHC in Hawaii? I said, well, Jim, I mean, i got to pray about that, man. I said, I've prayed through. I can do that. I could do that. It's about what we did. As Michelle and I literally were laying in bed. And it was always one of those dream things, and I'm indebted to IHC for inviting me to do that. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Because my dad lived in Pearl Harbor for three years. He was stationed in the Navy. And there while he lived there, he was stationed there working in the Navy. He was in the Navy 25 years. And, and it was always a dream because I, I loved the Pacific Theater of World War II. I, I, love, I used to think I was going to teach that. And, and I always wanted to go to Pearl Harbor because you, we all know what took place. If you know history, December the 7th of 1941 on that infamy Sunday morning when uh, Japan surprisingly attacked America at Pearl Harbor, Hawaii and other islands throughout the Pacific. And, and of course, we lost many a great men that day and many ships that went down. And it was always a dream of mine. And we went together and you took me and I thank you for that. We um, went to the Arizona, where the oil continues to leak out, with over 900 men still entombed in the USS Arizona battleship that was built in the early 1900s, 1910, 12, something like that, and it was sunk that day on December the 7th. A very solemn occasion, a very peaceful moment. It was a very tragic time in our American history, and of course, I didn't live in that time. But I have, um, I've appreciated the history and what I can learn from it. But if you know anything about it, you know, Japan was conquering island after island, territory after territory, and the great battle of Midway Island took place. It's really, if you, if you love history and you love battles, that's an incredible battle, how I believe the providence of God allowed our men in the, in the sky to see their ships before their men in the sky could see our ships at the battle of Midway Island. And, of course, we won a great battle that day, the turning point of the Pacific War, World War II, Pacific Theater. And, um, but before that, before that took place, Japan was conquering the islands of the Philippines. My stepfather found a, a beautiful woman in the Philippine Islands, or my real father, rather, found a beautiful woman in the Philippine Islands, and he married her, my stepmother, Salida, who still lives today, and a wonderful lady. And... Um, I have a precious spot in my heart for the Filipino people because of that. 
And, but if you know anything about history, you know that there was a, a general named MacArthur, Douglas MacArthur, that was on the Philippine Islands. And of course, the, the Japanese military, they were taking over the island and, and many of our soldiers were being killed and tortured and imprisoned. And, and MacArthur knew and our leadership knew that we couldn't afford to lose him. And so under the cover of darkness, they tell us they, they got him off the island. They got him away from there. But he left with those famous words that we've all known, we've all heard. He said, I shall return. He said, I'm coming back. He loved the Filipino people. Of course, he loved his own men that were there. And he said, I'm coming back. I shall return. And of course, Midway took place, the turning point, and America began to conquer. And, and thank God for everyone that served our country during that uh, just unbelievable time in our history. And of course, you know, the day came and the dropping of the bombs of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And, and um, America won a great victory, an incredible victory at that time. And you know what? We love the fact that a leader who said something and he kept his word. You know, we love leaders like that, who say what they mean, mean what they say. And we know history. MacArthur returned. He made his way back there. and Boy, we trumpet that and triumph that. That is wonderful. Oh, thank God for that. Oh, for leadership today that would say what they mean and mean what they say. It's a thrilling part of history. And we love it. But you know something tonight, more certain than the return of Douglas MacArthur to the Philippine Islands is the return of Jesus Christ to this whole world. Jesus is coming back one of these days. You say, well, preacher, do you really believe that? I've heard that all my life. I know I have too. But I want you to know something. We're closer now than we've ever been. And one of these days, He is coming back. The Bible says, the Lord Himself shall descend from heaven with a shout. And the voice of the archangel, the trump of God, and the dead in Christ are going to rise for us. What a day that's going to be. We're caught up together in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. You know, we love Christmas around here. I don't know if you're thinking about Christmas, but we're already thinking about Christmas at Penview. The musical preparations are underway. and Getting ready for the, the big events on December the 10th, 11th, and 12th, or whatever it is. We love Christmas, you know. Christmas in July. And we all love it because the story of Jesus, who came as a babe in a manger, prophesied that he would come, born of a virgin. We believe that with all our heart. The Bible prophesied. We believe that. But do you know, commentators tell us that for every prophecy of Jesus coming as a babe in a manger, for every one of those, there are eight to every one of those that say he's coming again. And yet we live and act like he's probably not coming. Sometimes we just go through life and just do our thing and as though He's not coming. We're not even thinking about it. The imminent return of Christ. But I believe Jesus Christ could come back tonight. I believe that with all my heart. And you know, the, the analogy of, of, of the bride and the groom, I think is something we all can latch on to tonight. We've all been a part of weddings. You've seen weddings. You know, Bible College has a way of, of bringing about weddings and the summer's full of weddings if you'd go to my refrigerator, you'd see uh, wedding invitations from all kinds of couples. I think, oh my, love is in the air in the community of Penns Creek. And I think we can relate to this, uh, the, the analogy of the bride and the groom. Because you see, when Jesus Christ, the bridegroom, comes back, he's not just coming back for ordinary bride. But when he comes back, he's coming back for a ready bride. Amen. A bride who's made the proper preparation. Hallelujah. Well, for some of you, it's been a while to think about, but, but you remember when you got married? Brother and Sister Evans, you're back there. Do you remember when you got married? Oh, uh, yes. Yes. Brother and Sister Eckes, you remember when you... I mean, you gotta, some of you got to think back. It's been a while. But oh, what a day that was. How exciting. I remember nobody, nobody in my family ever kept the same companion. Divorce and remarriage was rampant in my house, in my life. So I had no examples. And so I dreamed after I got saved to someday, maybe, God, would you help me to, to someday get the right one? Would you help me? I want to be married. I want to have a wife. I want to have a family. I, I, I want to break the cycle of, of my family history and, and leave a legacy. God, I want you to help me. And that was my passion way back there. I came to Bible college. Man, I thought it was like coming to... I thought it was like heaven on earth. Guys, I hadn't seen so many girls in skirts in all my life. 
And I came to Bible college. I thought, wow, look at them all. Which one, God? Which one? I was so ignorant to so many things. But it was real. It was real. Boy, I got a fat. I could spend. I can't do it. I got. I got. I got to keep moving. But I remember when when Michelle, my wife, she was a high school student. I was a college student, and you know we had interest in each other, and we started liking each other. And you know you had to write letters and send cards back in those days. There was no texting, no no you know, facebooking, no phone calls, you know, none of that kind of stuff. You know, it was old fashioned writing letters. Symbols meant something. You know what I mean? X's and O's weren't just alphabetical letters. They meant something. You know what I'm saying? So we had codes in our letters. Some of you have no clue what I'm talking about, but it's true. Ask the old people. They know exactly what I'm talking about. And I remember, I remember her and I are in a relationship, and, you know, we're enjoying and getting to know each other, and I don't know, two and a half years, let's say. I'm just going to shorten it, two and a half years, and all of a sudden, uh, I, I broke it off with her. I took her to Walker Lake, a nice setting, had the tissue box in the car, and I told her, I said, listen, you know, I'm just not ready for the next step, so I'm just breaking it off. And if we're going to break it off, I want it to be a memorable place. So Walker Lake was it. I was a nice guy. It's the truth. It's, not, it's the truth. And then I went to her house, and, and um, we played games the rest of the evening with her family because, you see, we were still friends. We truly were. And then all summers, we would travel in quartet. She was the piano player for the quartet I sang in all summer long. Just imagine that. Everybody, everywhere we went, they would think we were probably getting close to getting engaged. So, how you guys doing? Oh, no, I, I broke up with her a couple weeks ago. It would devastate them, you know. I wasn't devastated. It was, I was fine. She wasn't too fine, but I was fine. And it was a challenging summer, and we made through it and got through it. Now we're into the fall of the year, and, and um, you know, and honestly, I, you know, God was helping me. I had to settle some things spiritually. I, I, was, I was not everything I needed to be, and, and thank God he helped me that fall, and, and I got some things settled. It was in this camp meeting, tabernacle, at the altar. I was praying with some guys in the dorm, and God began to really impress upon me that, that, um, that I needed to, to get back with Michelle that I need to get back to her with her. She was the one. And, you know, I'm having devotions in the dorm, and I'm, I'm sensing this, and, and, and it, was, it was really real in my heart. But the problem was she had started dating another guy at that moment. How do you get up from your devotions, walk across the hall, knock on his door and say, hey, pal, God spoke to me. I'm supposed to marry your girlfriend. You know, that doesn't make for healthy relationships in the dorm. But in my heart of heart, that's what I was sensing. That's what I was feeling. And I thought, oh, God, I need your help. I don't understand this, Lord, but I couldn't get away from it. And, and so I remembered. I remembered somebody preaching about a fleece one time. And I thought, Lord, if it worked for Gideon, or would, would it work for me? And so I went to one of my buddies in the dorm. I said, hey, I said, hey, um, I said, um, do you believe in fleeces? He started giving me this big theological discourse. I didn't need all that stuff. Okay, just... Yes or no? Well, to affirm God's will, yes, as that's good enough for me. If it's God's will for me to marry Michelle Mason, if she's the one for me, I'm going to pray that God will help me to shoot a buck on the first day of buck season. My buddy looked at me and he said, all right, just so we know it's the Lord, we're going to pray for an eight-point buck. I said, okay, we're going to pray for an eight-point buck. Now, if I'd have known now, if I'd have known then what I know now, I'd have prayed for a big old Boone and Crockett. Big 200 incher. But then I probably wouldn't have got her. I'd have, been a, I'd have been a bad shape. So God knew my heart. But I got to put this in perspective. This was the Wednesday before Thanksgiving, before the Monday of opening day of buck season in Pennsylvania. And at this point in my life, I had never hunted a moment. I fished. I came from Florida. I didn't hunt. I mean, everybody in Pennsylvania seems like hunt. when they'd have special prayer in chapel for all the hunters, all the guys would stand but me. Half the girls would stand, it seemed like. And I'm like, I'm like, what is this deal about hunting? They even close everything down. Is this crazy? But don't we love it? Hallelujah. And so this is the Wednesday before Thanksgiving, before the Monday of deer season. I didn't have a hunting license. 
uh, got, you know, took, took care of the hunter trap class and, 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 um, and um, got a hunting license. I went to my father figure, Randy Hess, and I said, hey, I, I need to go hunting this year. And, um, and you said I could maybe shoot a rifle. And so he took me out practicing with a 270 Savage. Man, it was exciting. So I'm ready to go. My buddy Steve Stahl, he lived in the dorm. His dad, Marlon Stahl, who was here the other day, our, former, our preacher from Ickesburg area, he always said, hey, if you want to start hunting, you come hunt with us. So I called him up on Sunday. I said, hey, I want to start hunting tomorrow. That's not usually how it works, but that's what I did. And so they said, well, come on after church. So I showed up at their place after church. And um, I got there and, and um, you know, I went to bed. And you, got, you have to get up at such an unearthly hour. It was ridiculous. I mean, I got up and they had breakfast and all this stuff. And we're going out. And I have no, I've never done this before. And we walk out. We're in the dark. I mean, you can't even see. And they put me at this tree, my back up against the tree. Now just sit here, and when it gets daylight, you'll see all this ravine, and just stay here, and we'll, we're going to be a few hundred yards away. If you shoot, we'll come get you. You know, just stay put. And, and it, got, it, you know, it got daylight, but before it did, I heard stuff. I mean, stuff was moving. I didn't know what it was. I hear things, and I was so like, what is that? And my hand was ready, and I was on that gun, and it broke daylight, and there they were, the deer. Listen, my first two hours of Pennsylvania hunting experience, I saw over 30 Pennsylvania white-tailed deer, all of them less than 30 yards from me in my first two hours. It was like there was a deer behind every tree in Pennsylvania. It was unbelievable. No wonder why I got hooked. Remember, I'm praying for this eight-point buck, but I didn't see anything with antlers. Long story short, we're going out for the afternoon hunt. We're walking along a trail, and he says, okay, stop right here. He said, you turn right, follow these edge of this uh, hemlock trees and this open hardwoods and you'll see a tree house. Get up in it and stay there till dark. I'm going to turn left and I'm going to overlook a big old bowl. This trail runs straight for another mile so you can't get lost. Come back to the trail, out to the truck. Okay. So I made that turn. I go to this tree house and there were two people sitting up in that tree house. I thought, now I can't go there. Two's a company, three's a crowd. I learned that a long time ago. That's not going to work. Now what do I do? Well, I remember they said, he said that trail ran straight for a long ways and so I kind of angled and made my way back out to that trail. Sure enough, I got out to that trail, and I thought, what am I going to do? And I saw, I saw a stump. had a little piece of bark up the back like a chair, sitting right on the logging road. So I just sat down there, and, and I thought, well, I don't know where else to go. I might as well sit here. I can go back to the truck. And remember, I took my hat off because you always want to pray if you're going to hunt. So I prayed. I said, oh, God, keep your hand upon all of us as we hunt. You know, Brother Stahl and all the boys, Wes and Jamie and Joe and Steve, and, and keep your help us, you know, Ben and all the guys. And Lord, keep me safe. And then, then Lord, you know about this eight-point buck. If you want me to marry Michelle Mason, Lord, you just bring an eight-point buck along my way, Lord. Your will be done. Amen. I put my hat back on, and I'm sitting there. Now, listen, in those days, I was scared. I mean, I'm wearing orange pants, an orange jacket, an orange hat. I didn't want anybody to mistake in me. I probably look like a pumpkin sitting there in the woods. I'm mean, serious. And I'm sitting there, and all of a sudden, I look down the logging road this way. I didn't see anything. I wasn't stealthy. I was just looking around, looking around, looking around. All of a sudden, I look back to my left, and there's a buck. He's standing right in the middle of the logging road about 30 yards from me. I'd like to think he was dropped right out of heaven. There he was. And when I saw him, I thought, oh, my, there's a buck. And I clicked the safety off my 270 Savage. It sat on my lap. I didn't move. I just clicked it off. And the buck starts walking right toward me on the road. He gets 20 yards from me, and he stops. And he turns to the right, and he looks into the woods. He knows that's where all the hunters are supposed to be. He thinks, I'm in a, he thinks he's walking into a pumpkin patch. He has no clue I'm here. And I'm sitting there, and when he looks in the woods, I shoulder the rifle. I put the crosshairs of that 270 Savage and scope on his neck, and, and as he turned his head, I just squeezed around off, just like Randy taught me. I squeezed around off, and when I did, that buck dropped in his tracks. I jumped up, and I ran over to him, and I wasn't sure what to do because they really hadn't told me. And so, so I just poked him in the backside. I was hoping he didn't get up. And I, he didn't move. I thought, hallelujah. Then I went up to the head. I, had, I just shot him. It happened so quick. And I picked up his head. And I counted. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. It's an eight-point buck. Hallelujah. I'm going to marry her. Praise God. And I started shouting in the woods. Well, my buddy Steve heard me. 
He heard me, and he, he thought something in the world happened. Of course, he heard the shot. He could see somebody over there, but he doesn't know it's me because I'm not supposed to be there. I'm supposed to be in that tree house. And he comes over because he thought something bad happened, and he gets over, and he goes, wow, what a deer. I said, man, forget that deer. Let me tell you a real deer story. And I told him I'm going to marry Michelle Mason. Oh, yeah, I got back to the dorm that Monday night. I'll never forget it. Got back to that dorm Monday night. And, man, I was so excited. I knew it by Wednesday, Michelle and this guy wrote each other one of those Dear Johnny, Dear Susie letters. They were breaking it off with each other, not knowing the other was doing it. But when they broke it off, I thought, hallelujah, God is already at work. His dorm room door was open. I'll never forget. His door was open. And I saw him taking down her pictures from the wall, off the dresser from his wallet, and I don't know of holy boldness. I don't know what came over. I just walked over to him, knocked on his open door, and said, hey, pal, you might as well give me your pictures, because I'm going to get them anyway. And I got those pictures, and I took them, and I set them up in my room. Oh, yes, God was working. I knew God was working. Listen, you can't make this up. This is a fact. It was unbelievable. Oh, we went to Tuncanic, Pennsylvania with choir. And I asked her if she'd go to the Christmas banquet with me, and she said yes. We're in Schenectady, New York, at a Ponderosa Steakhouse, and President Zekman gave me permission to eat with Michelle by ourselves at her own table. Hallelujah for presidents that let us do things. Hallelujah. <laughs> I do that too, don't we? I asked her if she'd be my girl again. She said yes. Fast forward, it's, it's Valentine's. I take her dad, Barry Mason. I go to Visuals, Mr. Visuals, Barry Mason. You remember this, Barry? Oh, yeah, I show up at Visuals. How you doing? Great, wonderful. Any new songs? And we're just talking, you know, I'm trying to, okay. And I say, hey, Barry, I need to talk to you. Okay, I said, I need to ask you something. Okay, you might want to sit down. <laughs> Sat down, and I said, Barry, God brought your daughter and I back together. And I liked, I'd like to... I'd like to ask her to marry me tonight, and I'd like your blessing. I'd like your permission before I ask her. Now, all I wanted was a simple congratulations, yes, and I'm out of there. And he said, I, I, I've got a couple questions for you. You might want to sit down. No, I don't know if he said that or not, but he might have. I don't know. He said, how do you plan to provide for my daughter? Well, that's a fair question. I said, well, I'm going to be a preacher. I'm going to do my best. I promise you I'm going to work hard. I'll pastor. I'll preach. I'll, but I'll do whatever i got to do. But I will promise you I'll take care of her. I guess it satisfied him. He says, and let me ask you this question. Where do you plan to live? Because you will not live in our house. <laughs> Whoa. He was letting me know under no certain terms this home's not big enough for two families. I said, Brother Mason, no problem. Listen, if she's trouble, I'll take her now. <laughs> no, I didn't say that. I made that up. I made that up. <laughs> Oh, uh, he congratulated me, and I'll never forget, I, I borrowed Dan Fritz. He was at the funeral today, of course, that was his brother-in-law. And, uh, but uh, I borrowed his IROC Z. He had a blue sports car, an IROC Z. It was a beautiful car. I borrowed this car, and I picked Michelle up, and we were going to one of our favorite restaurants. It was a Chinese restaurant in Lewisburg. I'll never forget it. That place is tore down now, but we pulled into that Chinese restaurant, and I'll never forget, we... We walked in there. We like Chinese food, and so we walked in there, and it was kind of a neat place. It had a nice balcony seating area, and that's kind of where I wanted to go. And I'll never forget, we, we walked into that restaurant, and a little Oriental lady, Oriental lady standing there, and, and I walked up and said, hey, I need a table for two, please. And I said, I'd like a balcony seat. She goes, oh, the balcony closed. The balcony closed. Now, this balcony could not be closed. I mean, it's a, so I just kind of stepped away from Michelle and got real close to this Oriental woman. I said, Psst, listen. Balcony's open. Balcony, come with me. And she took us up into that balcony. Oh, man, I'll never forget it. And there over beef and broccoli and mugu guy pan, two good dishes, I asked Michelle if she'd become my wife. And she said, yes. Man, that began the journey of the bride getting ready for the wedding day. Oh, we made communication with my real father, even though I didn't have a relationship with him. And I got permission from the school board of directors, thank God for their permission, to get married in the middle of the school year, because you can't get married during the school year unless you have permission from the board of directors. Amen. That's good. I like that. And I got permission. 
I only had two classes to graduate, so they gave me permission. I was going to, you know, I was assistant pastoring at a church in Edders, and so they gave me permission. I was grateful. My dad was going to be home from being in Guam. He was stationed in Guam during those days and would only be home in December and January, and I wanted to invite him. And so we picked a date January the 2nd, 11 months later, to get married. And the wedding preparations would begin. Oh, uh, you remember those days, ladies? There's a lot to do to get ready for the wedding, isn't there? Oh, I remember Michelle. She was so, I mean, she was concerned about so many details, the flowers. I could care less. Fellas, we, frankly, we don't care about the flowers. I mean, every once in a while, maybe a guy would. That's okay. But, but I, I didn't care if it was roses and tulips, daffodils and daisies, orchids and violets. I didn't care if it was weeds. I didn't care if they were fake. It didn't matter to me. But it mattered to her. Oh, getting ready for the wedding was a big deal. The flowers were a big deal. And you know, all the things, the invitation, I'll never forget this. She said, would you go with me to pick out the invitation for the wedding? You know, we got to get ready and I got to get the invitations and we got to do this. And I said, oh, sure. Being a compassionate, loving, you know, uh, husband to be, I wanted to show support. And so I figured, okay, how, how many wedding invitation possibilities are there? And we got in there and this person says, okay, and he brings a pretty thick book and he sits it in front of the two of us. And he, she opens it up and the very first one, I said, oh, I like that one right there. I said, I think that one's your name on it, my name on it. We're good to go. I like that one. But no, we had to flip the page. <laughs> oh, I like that one right there. That's a good one. Yes, 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 yes. No, no, no. And we went through that whole book. And I thought, oh, just pick one, please. Just pick one. And the guy says, oh, by the way, I've got two more books. And he brings more books. I'll never forget it. I thought, oh, pick. But it matters to the bride. There's a lot to do to get ready. A lot to do to get ready. I'll never forget, I'll never forget me telling her, I said, now, Michelle, to be honest with you, I don't care about all that stuff, decorations, how many people, you know, bride's groom, miniature groom's, miniature this, and, you know, this, and the miniature flower this, and I, it doesn't matter to me how many people, okay, whatever you want to do is fine. I said, honestly, there's only one thing that really matters to me about this wedding. She goes, what's that? I said, honestly, the only thing that matters to me is the wedding dress. She said, really? I said, Yeah. I said, listen, you know, I mean, this is the way I'm going. And I know this is the way you're going, but, man, I've seen too many weddings. They, I mean, they, they profess to love God with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength, and they come in with no back. They come in with see-through everything, low necklines. I said, let me tell you something. You come down the aisle like that, I'll say no that day. I'll make a big issue. And she knew I meant it. And by the way, can I just stop long enough to say this? Young people, listen to me. Listen to me, when you're about to get ready to, to get married and all those things, those things still matter even on your wedding day. Modesty matters to God even on the marriage day when you're walking down the aisle. Amen. We don't throw our standards away just because of a wedding day. No, we glorify God in all that we do and say. Amen. I still believe that. And so I told her, I said, I don't need to see the dress. I just have to have the assurance that, you know, when it comes, she goes, oh, you can, I promise you, that's exactly how I believe. And my mom and dad, we're, everything's good there. I said, good, wonderful. Anybody here attend my wedding? Let me see your hands. Oh, there's hands all over this crowd. What a great day, getting ready for the wedding. You know, I, I told you all that because I just love to tell my story, and I had to tell it because it's, it's my romance story. But, you know, one of these days... Jesus is coming back. The bridegroom's coming back for a bride, and not just an ordinary bride, but he's coming back for a bride who's made proper preparation, a ready bride, a ready bride who, who has clean hands, that knows the reality of sins forgiven, that's clean on, on, on the outside. Thank God he can forgive you of your sins. Thank God he could save you. He could change your life and clean you up. Have you ever seen a bride come down the aisle dirty? Can you imagine Aaron Dorman? There you are. You just you're in my peripheral, so I got you. You and your wife. You remember your wedding, Aaron? Oh yeah, it was a great day, wasn't it? You and Katrina. How long has it been now, Aaron? Oh, I like that. He's, he knew that. Twelve years. Uh, could you imagine? Can I use you as an illustration? Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Could you imagine? Here's Aaron. You know, the big day comes. And, and all his groomsmen, they make your way down and, and they stand there at the church. And all of a sudden, you know, the bridesmaids are making their way in. And now the doors are closed. And now the, the organist plays. Dun, 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 dun. 
Da, 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 da. And the doors open. And you remember that day, Aaron? That was a great day, wasn't it? Oh, man. And here she comes with her daddy, David Newton. And he's coming down the aisle. And, and, and they're about a third of the way down the aisle. And she's got her white wedding dress on and that veil. And, and, uh, and she gives him a big smile through that veil. You remember that smile? That's the smile only you get. You know what smile I'm talking about, don't you? Oh, yes, you do. And here she comes down the aisle. And, I mean, she's halfway down the aisle now. And, man, he's so excited. He's grinning from ear to ear. Man, this is going to be a great day. And she's about a third from him, and she's getting real close. And all of a sudden, he notices the leftover bacon in the teeth, the breadcrumbs on the veil, maybe even some egg yolk dip dripping from her chin, a little jam on her fingers from the jelly and the toast. No, she didn't come down the aisle like that. She came down clean and pure and spotless. Why? Every bride does. But you know what's tragic? Is we're living in a day when there's a lot of people who think they're going to be ready, but they've got bacon in their teeth. They've got dirty hands. They've got unconfessed sin. And oh, my friend, Jesus died on the cross to forgive you of your sins. He shed his life's blood that if you'll confess, he'll forgive. He'll give you clean hands. You've got to be ready. Every sin has got to be covered by the blood. He's coming back. We've got to be ready. Because when he comes, he's coming back for a ready bride. A ready, ready bride who's sinless on the outward, but he's also coming back for a ready bride that is separated on the inward. Amen. A ready bride that's separated on the inward, set apart for him and him alone. Amen. Listen, you can't have your hand with God one hand and then have your hand in the world with the other hand. It doesn't work that way. You can't serve two masters. Can you imagine how foolish it'd be? My wife and I, I'll use us because I don't want to embarrass anybody else. But can you imagine my wife and I, we get married, we go on our honeymoon. We're on the honeymoon for three or four days, and all of a sudden she says, hey, by the way, I'm going to have to cut this short. Why is that? Well, you know that trio I used to play for, you know, Bill, Bob, and Harry? Yeah, I got to go back. We're going on a little tour, a little alumni tour, just the three of them and me. Well, didn't you used to date Bill, Bob, and Harry? Oh. I'm just making up names, by the way. Just making up names. I'd be saying, no, 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 no. You, you, you can't do that. Listen, when, 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 you, when you said yes to me, you said goodbye, Bill. Goodbye, Tom. Goodbye, Harry. And hello, Dan. Hallelujah. That's right. Because you're separated to him. To me. It's the same way spiritually. Because he's coming back for a ready bride. Amen. He's a, he's a bridegroom coming back for a ready bride that is, that is clean on the outside and separated on the inside. Oh, that God would help us to not have a hunger for the things of this world. Because he is coming back. Are you ready tonight? Do you know him? Do you love Jesus? Because when he comes back, he's not just come back also for a ready bride, but he's coming back for a radiant bride. I believe that. A bride who's got the, the joy of the Lord in their heart. Amen. Oh, what a thrill it is to be ready to love Jesus. You know, there's been a few weddings that I've seen, a few weddings that I've been familiar with that were tragic. They walked down the aisle knowing they should not marry that person, but they felt like they had gone too far. What a tragedy that is. Those tears weren't tears of joy, and I know that firsthand. And what a tragedy that would be to get married like that. Unfortunately, we've got a lot of young people today, and a lot of families today that, that they haven't taught well. And they think relationships is simply what they can get out of them physically. What I can get out of that relationship physically. And they don't, they don't build it on a proper spiritual foundation, an emotional foundation. The physical will come. There's not real love there. Young people, listen to me. I know we got a good youth evangelist. Thank you, my brother. You're going to be faithful. You have been. You will be. But young people, keep yourself clean and pure. Amen. Make sure that he's the number one reason that you're living. It's about Jesus. It's about serving him. It's about walking with him. Oh, thank God he's coming back for a radiant bride. You read the book of Revelation, you'll find the church that, that had left their first love. Well, what a tragedy that would be to start this way only to leak out and to lose out. 
Oh, he wants you to love him with all your heart, soul, mind. And you don't serve him for what you can get out of him. You serve him because you love him. Do you love Jesus tonight? Do you love Jesus? Is he your all in all? If he's not, he can be. You'll just come to him. He loves you tonight. Oh, what a day that's going to be. Sister Cassidy comes to begin to play something. Jesus Christ is coming back. He's coming back for a ready bride. A radiant bride with the joy of the Lord in her heart. Because one of these days, he's going to take him, a raptured bride out of this whole world. And what a day that's going to be. The Bible says the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout and the voice of the archangel, and the trump of God. And the Bible says the dead in Christ are going to rise first. Now, every once in a while, I thought, man, I remember the day I used to think, well, why do they get to go first? Well, they're a little further away than you and I are. Dead in Christ are going to rise first. And we, which are alive and remain, we're going to be caught up together with them in the air to meet the Lord, to forever be with the Lord. And what a day that's going to be. You say, well, preacher, when's he coming? Oh, I, I, I don't know. I don't know when he's coming. I remember being in high school. I remember coming to Penview in college. It was during the time that the, the, the book that was being put all over the place, 88 Reasons Why the Lord's Coming Back in September 88. Now listen, I was just a new Christian. I was hardly, I mean, I was only a couple year old Christian. And I knew enough about my Bible already at that moment, and I didn't know a lot. But I knew enough that the Bible says, no man knows the day or the hour. And I thought, how could this person be predicting the exact time? Boy, lots of people I think got caught up in that way back in the day. And I think if I understand right, that didn't work out. So 89 reasons why he's coming back in 89. No, no, no. We don't know. But oh, that God would help us to be ready. Help us to be ready because he's coming. He's coming. Listen, if you have unfinished business with God, I'd invite you to look to Him because He's coming back. Sir Ernest Shackleton in Antarctica, him and his men were compelled to, to stay on an island called Elephant Island, and, and he had to leave for some reason, but, but he intended to come back to his men. He intended to come back for his men, but he was unavoidably delayed, and the, the sea had frozen over, and the men that were left on the island, they knew about when they thought he'd come back and he didn't show up. And the one that was in charge on the island, he, he, he told the others, he said, hey, he said, we, we better pack up our gear and roll up our bags. The, the boss may come today. The story has it that they would pack up their gear and roll up their bags and they're waiting for the boss to come, but he didn't make it. And so they'd settle in again. And the next day would come, he'd say, hey, we better pack up our stuff, our gear, and roll up our bags. The boss may come today. And they would do that over and over until one day, Sir Ernest Shackleton saw a very narrow channel and began to break that ice open and made his way back with a rescue vessel to Elephant Island, no doubt going to find his men probably not surviving. But to his delight and shock, all the men were not only alive and well, but ready to get on board the rescue vessel. And man, what a celebration as they made their way back. And he, he asked the one in charge on the island, he said, how was it that you were so ready for my coming when you had no idea? I was so delayed. He said, sir, I would tell the men to pack up the gear and roll up the bags that the boss may come today. And we did that over and over and over. And we got to the place, sir, that we not only got ready, sir, we stayed ready. We stayed ready. Listen, I don't know when he's coming. Young people, I don't know when he's coming. You say, oh, but preacher, I want to get married someday. I understand that. I want to be a preacher. I want to be a pastor. I understand that. I want to go to the mission field. I understand that. But the reality is Jesus Christ could come back, and you've got to be ready. You can't miss it. You can't miss it. I want us to stand together tonight. Some have already come. Oh, if there's unfinished business on this Tuesday night, tonight's your night to get it settled to get ready with our heads bowed and eyes closed, saints praying. Oh, that God would help us tonight to get ready. Do you have a need? Why don't you come as the invitation is being played? Let God search your heart. And if he is speaking, would you just step out? Maybe your love has waned. You don't have that fervent love like you once had. Oh, would you let him do it? Maybe there's a pull in your heart for the things of this world. And you have a pull for God, but you have a pull for this world. God has a remedy for that. 
Amen. Maybe there's, there's bacon in your teeth. Maybe there's crumbs on your chin. You've got, you've got unconfessed sin on your life. Would you let Jesus come in? He loves you. He wants you to get ready. Don't miss it, my friend. None of us know the day or the hour. None of us know when that moment's going to be that He comes. And frankly, none of us know that day when we're no longer here. And we cross the line of worlds. Oh, that God would help us to be ready. Who will join these that have come to pray tonight? Come on, my friend. We're waiting for you. He loves you tonight. Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Go ye out to meet him. Are you ready? Are you ready? He's coming back. He's coming back. Are you ready? Are you ready? Help us, Lord, tonight. Just waiting a few more moments. Amen. I've done my best to mind the Lord tonight. Help us, Lord. Help us, Lord. Help us, Lord. Are you ready? One of the things that really impacted me this afternoon, this morning, was when somebody was sharing about Brother Arnold, some of his last words, how he wanted no question mark. He wouldn't want anybody to have a question mark about his readiness for heaven. You know, my friend, I don't want that in my, I don't want any question marks in my life. I want to leave a testimony. I want to be faithful. I want to make sure there's no gap between me and him. Are you ready tonight? Is there any question marks? If there's a question mark, if there's a doubt, why don't you come and pray tonight? This altar's for you. This altar's for you. He loves you tonight. Invite Jesus into your life. Let him meet the need of your soul. He'll give you victory. Amen. He'll love on you and you can love on him. Amen. Praise his name. With their heads bowed and eyes closed, no one looking around for just a moment. Would there be anybody honest enough tonight to say, Preacher, I need you to pray for me. There's a spiritual need in my life. And if you'd like to signify that with just lifting your hand up real quick. No one's looking around. I see that. I see that. I see hands all over. Thank you. Yes, yes, I see those. Amen. I see those. God sees you. He sees you. He sees you. I see you there. God bless you. I see that. Thank you. I see that in the back. Thank you. Amen. Oh, my friend, I wish you that raised your hand would just come and pray. Let us pray with you. Tonight's your night. You don't promise of tomorrow. None of us do. Oh, that God would help us to find victory. Just playing one more verse in chorus, Sister Cassidy. This altar's for you. If you have a need, would you come? Come and join these that have come to pray tonight. God knows their heart. There's young people here. There's children here tonight. Thank God. Amen. God's here. Thank God he's faithful. Anybody else tonight? Just come on. Don't hesitate. Just come on. She's playing the chorus, and we're going to gather in just a moment. Don't put it off. Don't delay. Let God meet your need. He loves you. He loves you. He wants you to get ready. That's why we have camp meeting. Thank God. That's why we have revivals. Praise His name. Are we finished? Amen. Let's gather in. Let's find somebody to pray with. God knows the hearts of these that have come to pray. Thank God he's faithful tonight. Praise his name. God's faithful. Let's just have a good season of prayer. Thank God for these children, these young people that are responding. Gentlemen over here, let's pray for him. God knows his heart. Amen. Praise his name. Let's have a good season of prayer. Brother Spangler, would you mind coming to the podium and leading us in prayer? Praise his name. for the messenger, for the truth, for your spirit that has come to minister to hearts and draw hearts to you. We're so thankful to know that 
You're still moving and working in our midst, still desiring, dear Lord, to prepare hearts to meet you. We're thankful, dear Lord, for the faithfulness of the Holy Spirit tonight and wooing hearts to come. You know of everyone that's seeking the young hearts, dear Lord, that are here, even the children. We're so glad to know that they can have a genuine experience a clear reality, dear Lord, of sins forgiven, that their hearts are set in order with you. We just pray, oh God, that you would touch each one of them. Help them, Lord, just to cry out to you, to tell you all about their heart, their need. Confess out to you, dear Lord, and ask for thy help and thy touch, for your healing in their lives. For that divine touch, dear Lord, that comes to make all things new to repair, dear Lord, what is broken, to restore what is gone. We just pray, Lord, for your help today. We're asking, dear Lord, that you take this truth tonight and speak to all of our hearts continually concerning it, that each one, dear Lord, would be careful to know that everything is right, everything is ready. We pray, dear Lord, that you'd help us as your children to be faithful followers of your word. Doers, dear Lord, as you would instruct, obedient, dear Lord, to the dictates of your spirit that clearly, no doubt, still speaks to hearts today. Help us to be willing, dear Lord, to be mindful, dear God, of your truth. And Lord, just obedient to it, to walk in the light of it. Help us, Lord, each one to know where we stand. Lord, every day to be prepared for your coming. We just pray, dear Lord, tonight that you touch those that have sought you and are seeking you. And Lord, that you would work out your perfect plan and desire, even tonight in their hearts. And yet you see those that have raised hands tonight for prayer, symbolizing the need. And we pray, oh God, that you would be merciful. Touch, dear Lord, in their lives as well tonight. Continue, dear Lord, to work in the camp. Continue, dear Lord, to touch through our good ministers, the Psalms. Let the Holy Spirit come and work in our midst. We just pray, dear Lord, tonight that you give a special touch to them. We know that you don't lead us here, call us here to a place of prayer for us to go away disappointed you cause, dear Lord, because you want to satisfy every longing and every heart. So we pray, Lord, that you give faith, give faith, dear Lord, to reach out and touch you, to believe you, for you always honor your word. You do, dear Lord, this is needed for man. We're asking, dear Lord, your perfect plan to be accomplished. So thankful, so thankful for so many answers to prayer. Tonight, dear Lord, we're trusting you still that each need would be met in its entirety. We'll give you honor and glory and praise and gladly from our hearts we'll say, Jesus, Jesus came and did it all. 